Thank you, everyone. Well, on behalf of uh, Bangi Samso, I'm Zarin. Uh, so I'm part of Center of Digital Experience, the division that uh, was built, dedicated to creating new digital banking proposition of Bank Islam, right? So on behalf of uh, Encik Yuzaidi, our board uh, member, Encik Muazzam, our GCAO, Puan Farila, our GCIO. So we would like to welcome everyone here tonight. And thank you for coming. A very good evening to our esteemed guests, uh, partners and friends who have joined us um, from all over here in EQ Plaza tonight. I hope you've had a nice dinner. I could not be happier to be part of the team to host our inaugural BUB Together event. It is our community vision that these thought-driven events will enable meaningful connections and spark conversations never thought possible before. For this evening, um, we are going to be talking about the evolving landscape of Islamic finance in Malaysia. So just to touch on it and to give it a little bit of context, Islamic banking is perceived to be comparatively new um, compared to the conventional counterpart. According to the Islamic Finance Development Report 2020, since its emergence 40 odd years ago in the 1970s, it's now seeing global Islamic financial assets and assets under management in the realm of USD $2.88 trillion with an annual growth of 14% as at December 2019. So today, according to REM ratings, uh, as reported in March earlier, Islamic financing in Malaysia, including that of development financial institutions, now constitutes 41% of total banking sector loans. So one can't deny um, the prominence that it has today. Thus, today's topic, we'll hear two voices on the evolving landscape of Islamic finance. Weighing in from fintech perspective would be Mr. Arif Siddiqui, who flew in all the way from UK to join us here in Kuala Lumpur. A Cambridge alumni, Arif, is founder and CEO of Castrol, a Muslim money app based out of UK. Also on our panel is Inche Mwaza Mohamed, who walked across casually <laughs> from Manara Bank Islam, our beloved group CEO of BIMB and proud sponsor of CDX. So perhaps to kick off the chat for tonight, um, perhaps you could share with us, uh, Inche Moza, and then moving on to you, uh, Arib. What are the biggest changes you've observed in banking over the past three years? Okay, so like you mentioned, in terms of prominence of Islamic finance, that one is undoubtedly has been growing far beyond the industry. It's always been double the growth. And this we can see in terms of going forward, there's still plenty of growth opportunity. When uh, we look at the, the kind of support and vision that the government has, you know, um, the recent financial sector blueprint puts a lot of emphasis on Islamic finance. And there's a good reason why it is like that. And I'm going to relate to what happened last three years, especially we just came out from COVID. And it was during that period that I would say where the practice of Islamic finance really shines and in, in the eyes of the policy makers, regulators, they started to see and appreciate the beauty of it. And in terms of how Islamic finance can help now at the forefront in, in going out uh, to the growth. Because if I were to dial back in uh, Islamic uh, finance industry, I think about four years back, we sat down and we think about how are we going to grow forward? How are we going to show the beauty of Islamic finance, especially in Malaysia? And now that has become uh, uh, something of a model, I would say, in other countries. So we came out with a value-based intermediation strategy document to be implemented by all the Islamic uh, financial institutions. So we started to implement it, yeah, mainly in um, towards the end of 2018-2019 and, and that's showcasing a lot more in terms of the innovation of the financial instruments that are available in Islamic finance and not available in conventional finance in terms of doing impactful projects. So when um, COVID came in and all that, so this is where uh, we put forward 
alternative finance that we have, for example, uh, equity-based, the blended finance through the usage of instruments under um, Islamic social finance, sadaka, zakat, and wakaf. And that gave the idea for the policymakers and, and, and regulators to say that there is a different way of instrument that we can structure that can help to benefit through this challenging period and growth. So obviously, when we look at the kind of emphasis, it puts a lot of uh, excitement and focus in terms of the growth that's uh, available uh, going forward. When we look at in terms of the changing needs of the customer, yeah, during the pandemic, we see adoption of digital uh, goes up very, very high. We see at the same time also there's a lot more people in the vulnerable group. So that creates the, the need for alternative way of being able to service them. We also see the emergence of, unfortunately, people trying to take advantage of people in difficulties. So there's a lot more scams you would have seen that makes us realize, other than in terms of like financial supports and financial products that we need to give to them, it's also about empowering them, financial literacy for them to manage their finances better. So these are the themes that I, I see coming up from it that makes us realize that we need to have something that we can offer to be able to contribute going forward. So that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inchit Mazam. So I'm, I'm hearing themes about shifting customer preferences and how our Bank Islam has taken the opportunity to position itself as a value-based intermediary. I would love to hear from Arib as well. Uh, how do you think the landscape has changed over the past three years from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Leona. I think um, we've moved into a world where digitization or digital apps, whatever you'd like to call it, is very much the norm or the bare minimum as opposed to a plus uh, with many institutions. Uh, it started five, six years ago. You know, we saw this in the UK with the explosion of so many digital banks, digital banking offerings. And back then it was new, it was hot. You know, people were, uh, thought it was something they'd never seen before. And very quickly the banks over there in the United Kingdom caught on to that. And they managed to understand that what they really needed to do was to solve the end user problem. Right, which was finding new ways for people to manage, grow their wealth, and get new personal insights from them. Um, that was the really kind of smart, new, innovative thing uh, that was taking place. When it comes to Islamic banking, they've always been uh, traditionally behind the curve in the UK, at least. You know, we've seen big, big banks who've always struggled to really appeal to the primarily young uh, target Muslim market, uh, which is why we were really heartened here to, you know, when we got the call from, from Bank Islam to, to hear about what they, they really wanted to do um, and take learnings that, that we had found in the UK through our consumer app and to take the chance to actually apply them out here in a completely new economy, which, um, to be honest, an app of this nature hasn't really been seen before with the kind of insights that we can provide. It's really hitting the customer problem um, nail on the head. <laughs> if you will. So that's why we were, we were really excited to do this. So I think uh, with this, we can really start to drive the Islamic banking market forward in a completely new way from what should be the Islamic banking capital of the world. So. Well, very much. I think both of you have pretty much also covered what the outlook is looking like based on your experience over the past three years. Moving on to the next question, everyone here today is quite curious to understand, maybe uh, Arib, you could tell us more about how you got here, what brings you here today, um, based on your experience, and tell us the story, how, why are you sitting in the chair? You mean like the flight that I took? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Um, so yeah, Kestrel stop. Yes, that was three hours, gosh. Um, <laughs> so uh, Kestrel started two years ago. It was born out of a university project uh, when I was doing an MBA at, at Cambridge, together with my co-founder, Dying, who's right there. <laughs> um, it started off as, a, as really a frustration. It was born out of a frustration that we both shared, at our inability to bank and invest in line with our religious beliefs back in the UK. The existing solutions were had a terrible user experience, were far too expensive, and people didn't trust those institutions. So we wanted to do something to try and address that. Fast forward, and you know, just over a year ago, we launched our consumer app to the market, which was personal finance for Muslims, providing budgeting, savings, and investment solutions to them, pulling in their existing banking data to provide those sorts of insights. Uh, we, w whilst we are headquartered in the UK, we've always had a very strong Malaysia presence, uh, dying being 
hailing from Malaysia, went back to set up our intrepid little uh, tech team based out in uh, Johor Bahru. We've got some members here today. Um, so we've always maintained and kept that Malaysia connection. Uh, and because of that, we joined a, an accelerator program, FICRA, uh, launched by the SEC, where we went through that program with them and displayed our app late last year in, in a demo day, which thankfully Bank Islam was, happened to be in the audience, uh, and that was a great connection uh, uh, for us. Through that, I think you know, we love the vision uh, that Bank Islam had. It really, really aligned. Ultimately, it was all about values. You know, our mission at Kestrel is to drive the, the Muslim market forward to help Muslims to want to grow their wealth without compromising their beliefs. And naturally, at Bank Islam, those kind of went hand in hand uh, with, with your own values. So I think that was really where the first, um, the, the first kind of synergy started to emerge. And then when, when we heard Muazim's uh, plans for it, the, the rest uh, was history. So that's sort of how I got there. If, you know, if, if you're asking me for, for tips as to how I got here, you know, alhamdulillah, was, I, you know, I can't really tell you how <laughs> we kind of did. Um, but you know, we're very pleased to be, be where we are now and, and working together for BU. Thank you so very much for that little story on how we've arrived at where we are. So based out of that, in Cheikh Muazzam, I think the room is also eager to hear. How did you identify Kestrel as a suitable partner to power our PFM solution in BU? In a way, for us, we take the uh, perspective of looking at what kind of proposition do we want to uh, give to you know, our target audience. We are clearly identify what will be useful to them. And then, uh, then we see how do we get there. So this is where we were looking for solutions. Like I did mention that one of the things that we try to address that this is not going to be just a banking app. It also needs to be able to help our target segment, for example, to increase their knowledge about financial management, also prob helping them to increase in terms of their ability to earn or to upskill themselves. Those things are important. And obviously from there we look at how do we get these capabilities to be able to be served. And we've always had this approach of doing via collaboration. I always believe from day one that while other traditional banks would see FinTech as competition, everywhere we go they always seek you know, the threat of fintechs, uh, we always look at it as an opportunity to get that kind of capabilities a lot faster than if you were to, to build each and every one of these components ourselves. So, in terms of, uh, Arif did mention, we share the same kind of values. And, of course, we look at, in terms of the capabilities that are there in the team, we look at the commitment. So, I think um, it all ticks the right boxes. And there's opportunity and the kind of uh, vision that we have and aspiration that we have in terms of going forward, it aligns. So that's how we, we got here. No, I, I'd, I'd just love to add on to that. I think the point around fintechs and banks and seeing each other as competitors, in Islamic finance, I just feel like it's always been, we should stop treating it like a zero-sum game. I think partnerships and collaborations are 100% the way forward and how we will ultimately move this forward to serve new, exciting, younger, tech-savvy communities in that way. Um, so just for any fintechs out there, I think, Collaboration all the way, is what I wanted to say. It's excellent that you brought that up. So it's really a convergence of interests and also seeing how we have overlapping target segments, always trying to drive financial wellness. Um, tell us more, Inche Mazam, in the development of BU and in driving financial wellness. Tell us about the differentiated offering. You touched on the target segment earlier. Perhaps you could delve more into that area. Tell us what is the exact target segment that we are pursuing and what are our plans to uplift them? We, we are very clear. We build based on the persona and the persona that we have are people, the young people, people in universities, final year, they got their first job, maybe young families. And we try to understand what their uh, life revolves and what's important for them. What's important to them at that stage would be in terms of how do they expand their income? How do they upskill themselves, right? And we also understand that for people in this group in today's day and age, I mean, not all, the, all of them are employed. So they, they may employ themselves, gig works and all that. So we build a proposition around that. We know that it must be something that we can um, offer them quickly, always be in tune with their needs. And in setting it up, you know, we make sure that we uh, listen to them, be close to them, to know that we are really serving what they require. 
Encik Mazam, that sounds like quite a compelling uh, digital offering. I'm sure the room is curious to know, uh, might it render branches irrelevant then? Okay, so there's always this question in the last two years, especially due to COVID. It really accelerated the adoption for digital and, and we saw that even in our traditional customers. Initially they hesitant to use internet banking. I remember those days, you know, when we were promoting internet banking, people are worried about fraud. But when we have lockdown and we saw tremendous growth in terms of our transactions or di digital channels. But at the same time, when we talk to our customer, we realize that there will still be need for branch network. But in terms of what our customers would require from the branch uh, now and going forward would be different from how it was if going forward obviously uh, in terms of branch i wouldn't say that is not required anymore but what do we deliver at the branches that would be different with that it means that we need to have different capabilities to give that different offerings and services that people will require from a branch Having said that, at the same time, we also build deeper capabilities and functionalities for our online channels. And we do BU, it's with the perspective of whoever customer using BU, they don't need to go to branches. But the benefit of what we have, because we also backed by the, the bigger brother, which is Bank Islam, that has got physical uh, branches. There will be uh, times whereby even the customer of BU would require interaction on face-to-face -face basis and that's where Bank Islam continue to be there to be able to, for example, like, you know, where do I withdraw money? But if I need cash, so that physical infrastructure is there. And the other thing is that we've got a strong institution with big capabilities. When you talk about digital banking, it's not just the digital part, it's not just the UI UX part, it's also the banking part. So in terms of when you talk about banking, managing finance, managing funding, this is something that we have already developed uh, in the last 40 years. So I think I would say the enthusiasm of the youth backed by the wisdom of the experience, that is something that is going to ensure sustainability. I, I just, I'd just like to, to jump in quickly because sure. in, in the UK we're part of uh, Santander Bank Accelerator Program. We saw a really nice combination between their digital app and their branches where we noticed a, a pattern where um, young people use the app to an extent, but when it comes to major decisions like taking out a mortgage or getting a business loan, they want that human interaction. They want to come into a branch and, and talk to someone. So it was a really interesting thing where the hypothesis of, no, do away with branches and coming onto the app wasn't quite proven there. And actually it was cool because they started to convert some of the branches into business centers and cafes and places where people were just coming naturally to talk to, which was like a really nice little sort of community aspect popping up there. So it was just something I wanted to, to add there. So I'm hearing um, from both of you, you know, it, there's a portfolio approach from large institutions when we come to have digital offerings and combine it with branch offerings. It really boils down also to the customer acquisition and also retaining them. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. You mentioned, Arif, how you really resonate with the strategy of Santander Bank. How do you see your plans coming up, you know, in response to what the landscape is. What are Kestrel's plans in the coming years? Uh, well, the first thing is we want to help be you <laughs> get to get out. Uh, we want to help uh, help bring the same lessons that we've learned there in the UK um, about using customer data to provide them with really interesting financial insights, showing them how much of their salary they can and they should be saving how much they should really be ring fencing for their essential expenditures and how much of their should really be going towards the non-essentials and where they can recognize savings in between. Those are the things that we really, really want to help focus on and what we've learned over in the UK, we'd love to apply over here. Uh, but the really cool part comes in with, not only are you telling people how much you should be saving every month, but then you automatically start to do it on their behalf. You start to remove the worry and the work out of the process that comes with financial management that so many young people face today, where you start to just siphon off you know, some spare change to larger chunks of money into ring fence pots, which can actually be grown right, in the background, just passively, as the, without them even having, having to plan too much about it. Right? Pots which can be linked and pushed off to other products within the ecosystem. So that is kind of what gets us at Kestrel out of the bed in the morning to really kind of tackle a problem that so many young people in the UK, especially young Muslim people, 
uh, face on a daily basis, which is just the pure anxiety that comes with, I need to start planning my life properly and getting my finances in order, and I need some serious help to do that. Um, so that's really, those are the lessons we, we hope to bring along here at, uh, here at BU. Uh, but we love that we can do this whilst also play around with our consumer app in the UK, uh, serving that because we learn so much through that. Um, and that's, that's really what, uh, what we want to keep on doing. Well you, s well, you still have the mic on, um, and I'll just sort of uh, wrap up the fireside chat before closing off with Inchit Muazzam. Uh, based off on you know, your exciting plans for the coming years, and I love that you mentioned you know, what gets you out of bed and what keeps you up at night. Can you tell us a little bit about what fintechs can do more? You know, just zooming out a little bit. What can, what can the overall um, ecosystem do to drive more value? I think when it comes to fintechs, especially Islamic fintechs, there is a really bad pattern that many of us are guilty of, of just trying to replicate existing business models from the conventional space. Just, okay, we'll take that, slap an Islamic label on it, and that's what we're going to do. Um, users aren't stupid. They, they see through it, and they've been burned before. Um, and that's something which is not going to really have any staying power. Uh, what we're doing at Kestrel and why we've really invested in our tech team and our data science team is we really want to bring something innovative and new to the market um, rather than just borrowing a tired old, old business model that arguably hasn't really been proven in the past. So I suppose what we're doing here is we are pushing on innovation, innovation, and innovation, uh, really trying to find a way to truly change the way that people interact with their personal finances. So that's what we're trying to do at Kestrel. Great, thanks so much for sharing that, Arif. So uh, moving on to round up the fireside chat, uh, Inchet Muazzam, could you also share from your perspective, uh, what can banks do more to drive customer value? From our perspective would be in terms of moving away from our old habit of doing product pushing and providing something which is of value to the segment. And that's what we are trying and experimenting with PU, look at it differently think about the customer and build a proposition around what they need. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, collaboration with uh, fintechs is important because uh, many fintechs out there, they have got good ability in terms of understanding customer needs and customers' problems and coming up with solutions that we can tap into. I mean, understanding in terms of how a fintech sets up compared to how bank sets up in a way and being able to meet in between. A lot of time I see in the past the failures is that you know, banks, we think that we may be big, therefore we want to dictate all terms. That's where things fail. So we need to give some space as well. But at the same time, we've also been in a situation whereby the fintechs, when they come in a bit too green, because we are playing in a regulatory environment. So some appreciation of those things that you like it or not, you just have got to do it, you've got to comply. So I think being able to be flexible enough and understand and learn, like I said, bringing in this, this enthusiasm of the youth together with the wisdom of those people who've been there, I think that will bring about successful uh, collaboration for both parties, the fintechs and also the traditional banks like us. Thank you so much, Inchit Mazam. I think you know we're hearing about how fintechs can really complement the existing banks and how we can actually drive customer value together by with the banks, you know, continuing to lend while the fintechs can complement the adjacent spaces. So and of course there's also speed to market and overall driving the holistic customer proposition. Thank you so much. We're wrapping up our fireside chat and I hope all of you got some value out of today's session. I'm going to cover some Q&As from the floor. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Perhaps I'll start off with Arib and then I'll move on to Inchit Mozam. So the question is, what advantage does BU have as compared to the other five new digital banking licenses that have been issued? How can Kestrel help? Well, I suppose the big one is that BU has a one to two year head start uh, where those guys have you know, only just gotten their licenses working very hard to do that. Uh, BU is already out in the market. So I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is like I mentioned around collaborations, BU has the big brother of Bank Islam, um, which comes with a whole ecosystem of products that can be pushed, 
um, along with a funding channel. And that makes a huge, huge difference in the startup space where if you are, not all of them are, are purely startups, but from experience, when you're a startup, you're continuously thinking about runway and burn rates, and those things occupy a lot of your time. Uh, the other big problem is, of course, finding actual product. Like you said, green fintechs, um, a, a big, big issue is you know, dealing with the regulators for the first time. Um, and also, not just having the tech, but having the actual capital and product to push as well, which something without a bank, uh, you know, a traditional bank behind you, with the regulatory expertise, the capital, and the existing products can be very hard to actually accomplish. So in that way, you know, BU is still very much ahead of the pack. In terms of how, and Kestrel coming in as well with our personal financial management tools as well, um, means that by no means are we starting from scratch, so that collaboration really, really helps set it apart. Thanks for that vote of confidence. And what about you, Inchip Mazam? Are you able to weigh in on how BU will be differentiating itself from the other five contenders? Uh, sorry, the five digital consortiums that have been issued a license. I think a lot of it has been said by Arif. I mean, they are trying to put together teams who have already uh, gone live, basically. And also in terms of the kind of functions that you put be beyond the, the channel that you put in is the whole set of capabilities that you do not see in a bank. So it's not just about the app, it's not just about the user friendliness of the app. It's also about the trust, the, where, where you put your money, how it is done. And most importantly is that when you talk about digital and banking, it's all about how efficient do you manage your fund. Because I mean the app can be very nice, but your cost of capital cannot be good enough, you won't be able to provide the best value in terms of your proposition to your customers at the end of the day. So those things are very important in their decision making as well. So we bring in those kind of experience, to those kind of expertise. You know the treasury expertise that we've got behind BU, for example, um, that probably for uh, a new bank, these new uh, licenses, those are the kind of expertise that they have to build for them to be able to sustain. And for us, but like Arif did say that those are the kind of things that the big brother is always there to provide those kind of expertise that are hidden that people don't see but it's very critical for sustainability of any digital bank. Thanks so much, uh, Inchek Mozam. So I'm hearing about the backing that we have and also the obsession with customer centricity. Uh, that we'll continue to put customer in the middle and trying to win the customer. Let me see, I think there might be one more question from the floor. Since BU is borderless as a digital bank, are there any plans to expand beyond Malaysia? Inchek Mozam, perhaps you could tackle that one. Yeah, I mean, there's always opportunity, we will look at it, but more importantly is that we want to make sure that what we have here uh, is successful. Uh, it's only early days. While well, I'm uh, convinced that what we have is right for what we have now, we will need to continue to see how we move along. There's always that ambition. And when, even when we talk about you know, extending it beyond our shores, there's a few things that we need to bear in mind that we are in a regulated business and it's not as seamless to move beyond our shores. But how can we go there? There will be a few options. The immediate focus for us would be to make sure that it is successful here to stake our claim uh, to be the leading uh, digital bank in Malaysia, then inshallah, um, I mean the ambition is always there with great backing from our board, especially uh, Cik Uzaidi who makes himself to be with us here. The opportunity is there and we remain uh, optimistic. Excellent. I'm sure a lot of us will be excited to see what's coming up. Okay, so that rounds up our Q&A session. I would like to just thank you, our panel speakers for today, Inche uh, Moza Mohamed, as well as Arif Siddiqui for sharing insights with us. And to our audience also, thank you for joining us and tuning in.